Wanderers show. Welcome to the latest edition of the Wickham Wanderers show. Uh, slightly international feel again this week. Not quite as international as last week in that we're not speaking to someone who's just come back from Poland, uh, but we are speaking to someone who's in America. Bob was in... Where were you last week? Um, so last week I was in Phoenix in Arizona, um, and this week I am in uh, New York City. Wow, the Big Apple. Uh, <laughs> the Big Apple, indeed, yes. Um, uh, still nobody has commented on any of my Wiccan Wanderers um, gear that I, I'm wearing, which I'm, I'm slightly sad about, because I thought the Wiccan Wanderers worldwide phenomenon, never any good at saying that, um, was getting bigger and bigger. Um, and obviously, we, we now have 4,000 Iraqis. Is it 4,000 or 8,000? I can't remember. Now, following us on Facebook, um, but um, I, I've not come across any of them in New York. <laughs> I think it's, I'm sure it's just a matter of time. I'm sure it is, yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm determined that somebody is going to ask me about my Wicked Wanderers top um, before I return home uh, this time next week. If not, just try and cause a scene, and then they probably will. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, at the airport, I don't think that will end very well, and then you might not actually see me again for another couple of years. <laughs> but it'll be a great story, and one we'll talk about for years. Uh, that, that's true, yes. Yes, when you see in the, the newspapers, uh, a British man with a Wiccan Wanderer's top was detained at, at JFK Airport. Um, yeah, that, that might be quite entertaining. Coming up on this week's show, <laughs> in a more normal way, uh, we'll be reflecting on uh, back-to-back wins, which have seen Wiccan Wanderers move level on points with new leaders Rotherham. A fantastic victory uh, on Saturday against Bolton Wanderers in the Wanderers derby. Uh, and then uh, a fantastic win as well on Tuesday evening down at Plymouth Argyle, who were... <laughs> Who were? <laughs> is that how they talk? Who were? Um, who were the league leaders at the time uh, before the game? So we'll, we'll be looking at that, especially on the back of a, a run of five games without a win. Especially pleasing. Uh, also, we'll be catching up with the chairman of the Wickham Wanderers Ex Players Association, Alan Hutchinson, who's worked alongside twelve managers at the club, uh, which coincides quite nicely with uh, twelve years of the current boss, Gareth Ainsworth, being at the club. I'm sure you used that accent when we also played it switched down. You might well be right, actually, yes. It's just a... a <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Your generic to... West Country <laughs> stroke uh, East Egg accent. Yeah, <laughs> need to work on that a little more. Uh, all that and more on the way in the next hour as well. Plus, of course, we'll look ahead to the trip to Sheffield Wednesday uh, here at Wickham Sound. But first, uh, let's chat to uh, Bob in America. <laughs> <laughs> Let's Which, uh, yeah, sounds, sounds a bit strange. Let's chat to Bob in America about, about a game that was at Adams Park. Our American correspondent, uh, and also, as, as mentioned, <clears> we'll, <throat> we'll reflect on a new signing which was uh, announced, unveiled just before kickoff on Saturday as well. But uh, what, a, what a great turnaround! Because only last week we were reflecting on five games without a win and thinking, <laughs> "Oh no, what's happening? What's happening? Nothing's happening. Nothing's happening. What's happening? What's happening? What are we going to do?" <clears throat> and then, all of a sudden, as if by magic, from nowhere, two wins appear. <laughs> Indeed, I think it's it's crisis. What crisis? All of those people on Facebook who were being very negative, and even some of them being slightly negative about Gareth. Uh, well, you know, well, what a difference a week makes, and how fantastic. Uh, two wins. Um, you know, Bolton Wanderers at home. Well, yes, if your promotion uh, candidates, clearly you, you're you probably thinking that's three points. Uh, but away to Plymouth, I didn't really see that one coming. Certainly not a 3-0. How, how fantastic. Um, but yes, let's first of all focus on uh, the home game against the Bolton Wanderers. Um, and it was very much the Sam Volk show. So in the first half, um, he hit the post. Uh, I don't think I've ever seen a shot look more likely to hit the post and then cross the line that didn't than Sam Vokes' one. It was almost like one of those, you know those, oh, yeah, but actually Colin, you probably don't because you're not into dogs. Those dog toys you can get, those dog ball toys you can get, uh, where the ball doesn't quite move in the way that it should. That's how, how Sam Vokes' shot uh, against Bolton that hit the post looked to me. It was like, yeah, this is definitely going to go in. Oh, no, no, the ball's moved in a very strange way and it hasn't. Are they available in the club shop? I knew you were going to say that, and they should be, yes, uh, along with the dog leads uh, and the battery-operated trousers. Predictable humour. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> There's certain things that we have to mention every week, uh, just for all of those people who are, are playing the Wicked Wanderer show bingo. Uh, there you go. You're, you're already halfway to a full house already. Um, <laughs> then, obviously, um, Sam Vokes uh, did score in the, the second half, uh, a fantastic header. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we ended up seeing out of the game, uh, which, thank goodness for that after. The, the run of defeats and, and not winning at home that we have had. I was going to say, especially at home, it seemed to, seemed to feel especially good. 
Well, and yeah, and I think because we've made so much of our home form, and you know, what was it, eight, eight, you know, eight home wins on the trot, and then to suddenly, you know, see our home form basically fall off a cliff um, was was not was a bit of a surprise, and clearly not welcome at this stage of the season. Uh, but I do think, with regards to the the whole League One uh, promotion of race, I. I know it's a cliche, but it is that thing of it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. And it, it is one of those marathons that you now watch and, and you think, oh, yeah, OK. So, so, so almost everybody's having a little bit of a go at the, at the front of the, the field. And it's only going to be, I think, in the last sort of like five or six games that we're actually going to see uh, somebody emerge from the pack. So we mustn't panic too much when actually, you know, we, we've gone a few games without a win um, because clearly we can bounce back as we have proved. And as we've heard the manager say on this show, you know, he had belief um, and I'm sure many of the players, of course, uh, did as well and, and so many chances created in recent games and it was only a matter of time before they went in. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, he, he, he will always, so that obviously he always backs his team. He keeps saying to us, you know, it's the best squad that he's ever worked with and the fact that we're talking about a squad um, you know, clearly we, I think we have missed Gareth McCleary and it's wonderful that, you know, that he is now, now back. Um, and yeah, I think we just have to have that belief when things aren't going well, that actually they will turn the corner and those wins will start coming back. And, you know, they're definitely, you know, pr- proved in the last two games. Let's get the thoughts of the manager speaking after the game at Adams Park. Yeah, for half time, you must have been scratching your head and thinking, is there some sort of force field around your position goal? Hit the post and another penalty safe. Yeah, and, and you know, we, we uh, to come back from that and to have the belief we did in the second half after that, you know, and after, not just after that, after what's come in the last couple of games, you know, Hartlepool and Portsmouth, um, the, the attrition on their goals and with no reward, um, the boys must have thought, is, you know, is there something on these goals? Is, is, there, is there a film a cling film or something on the, on the whole goal? But no, um, I think Volks has had a word to try and get the posts widened a little bit, but we have to stay within the regulations. But when it mattered, he popped up with a fantastic goal. You know, and that's what he's been signed for. Uh, he's a real leader. He's uh, he, could, he will lead these boys, and they'll follow. Um, you know, there was an overload for Bolton at times. You know, obviously tactically we, we see a, a lot of stuff, and uh, and you know Jason McCarthy did an enormous amount of running to to almost cover two players today, and then Anthony Taff and Jordan at the back there had to had to be stretched at a three on three. Um, and there were some worrying words, you know, and some worrying looks at times. But uh, I said to him, trust the system, trust what we're trying to do here today. Because if we'd have gone defensive today, we wouldn't have created as much as we did. But we created, we scored, and we saw the game out really well. Gareth McCleary coming back from fitness is a, is a huge plus for us. Um, I thought Anis had one of his best games for us. He's learning all the little tricks now in football, which is what I want him to do. And, um, and like I say, you know, the big players today, David Stockdale, I thought was, uh, was outstanding with some of the saves he made not not major there's one one on one first half which yes he's got to do but their keeper had one as well um, but just you know he's sure at the end there with uh, with coming out and making himself big his feet were fantastic today um, and Sam Volks you know when it, when it needed to be put in he was a fantastic header you know back to his uh, Premier League days I think that one so really pleased great 1-0 win for us and uh, it's nice to put those two defeats to bed you know I've spoke to Rob Kuig in the week um, and his backing was just awesome you know he allows me to get on with what I want to do without any pressure um, you know I'm not saying he uh, he doesn't he doesn't uh, demand from me of course you know he's, he's put money into this club and uh, but he's uh, he's great where you can calm my nerves sometimes and that allows me to, to pick the right formations the right teams the right tactics and uh, and get the right result uh, you talked about Jason McCarthy it was his cross there and uh, Wickham's crossing perhaps let them down a bit in the last two games but today he was really back on it yeah I don't think just crossing I think finishing like it's down in the last two games you know we've had some good opportunities and we, we just haven't capitalised on them so um, Jason works hard on his crossing every day in training he'll be out there um, doing his little bits as they all will they all, they all work on their little individual bits and they are what matter you know in, in games when it's so tight and Bolton came um, we knew the tie second half after what they went through midweek um, they're probably a little bit weaker than they have been um, but Ian's a good friend and, uh, and he'll have them going so for me this is a good scalp at home um, but these boys who practice day in day out these little bits that, that don't seem that important they'd rather do shooting or every day Jason's on his crossing Anthony's on his heading Taft's on his heading you know David Stockdale will do every training session like it's his last one all these things matter when it comes to a game like this because believe me 
we felt um, a little bit of, uh, of unjust and injust and, and a little t- a tiny little bit of pressure because we want to achieve this year we've got one of the best squads in the league I believe and uh, and I want these boys to stay around this top half of the table for as long as they possibly can, you know, right to the end of the season and see where we end up. It's been a small sticky bum, but it's the first time you've had expectation really as a manager because Wickham are down from the championship, a bit more money than you normally have. How, how have you found that? Yeah, I mean, we've a bit more money than we usually have, of course. So, like, I've been backed. We're still way down in, in the spending stakes in this league, I'm, I'm telling you now. But, but um, the chairman said top six this season. The chairman wants the top six, you know, and I want I want to deliver that to him, you know, and, and that's uh, that's important for me to, you know, to, to get the right to... I, I, historically, I don't need... I don't need the top budgets to, to achieve. I, I never will, you know. But um, he's given me a competitive, more than competitive budget, you know. We're signing players. We signed a young Iraqi international before the game. Fantastic for this football club to be doing that. Um, and it all builds that pyramid to, the, to that top where the results count. And uh, and today that one really counted, you know. It, it was... It, it looks now like a tiny sticky room, but when you're in the when you're in the the, the centre of the whirlwind, you know it's five without a win, and it's and it was, you know, where's it coming from? How, what do we have to do? You know, you know, your you Burton game, it was a development boys, but it, it counts in your scores, you know, and your Hartlepool, which is the FA Cup, which we're never going to win. Oh, I say that about this club. They got the semis once, didn't they? So, <laughs> but it, but again, that counts towards the uh, the run, the bad run that you're on. So. Really, it was just Ipswich and Portsmouth, two teams that I think will be around the top of the league anyway. Um, but to get back on track today was really important, and I can't thank the fans enough, um, all my backers enough, and uh, and the boys. They, they deserve that one today. They were fantastic. And the fireworks at the end as well. So you have to have a win, really, before they go. Well, it's nice this time of year because it's all dark all the time, so you can see them. And uh, I didn't, know, I didn't even know about that. I didn't expect it. Um, but I know Rob wants to make sure that the fans have a great time when they come into this place. And if fireworks at the end after a win helps them come back I'm all for it um, I was singing Christmas songs in the town centre Thursday night to try and get a few more fans in here and I think they were you know because their voices were better than mine was on Thursday today it was a it was a real Wiccan performance the town the staff the players um, really really good to get the 1-0 win I understand you want to dedicate this win to someone as well <laughs> I can't dedicate it it's not my win it's the players win but I just want to say happy birthday Scarlett my uh, my 18 year old daughter yesterday and uh, she's come to the game today I think uh, uh, Matt Cecil was saying the image was flashing on the screen and uh, happy birthday from the gaffer um, I didn't see it I'm concentrating on the game so I'll trust him on that one but um, she was 18 yesterday she might even join me with a beer tonight but um, happy birthday Scarlett really nice touch from the manager there uh, with his daughter uh, oh. that's nice isn't it oh it was nice wasn't it and there was a, a slightly unusual Gareth Ainsworth slip there when he said about the FA Cup and we're never going to win that. <laughs> um, I, I wonder almost if he went away for that interview and said, oh, I, thought, oh, I shouldn't have said that really. Uh, um, but, but yeah, that really, really interesting interview, really interesting as well about the players individually working on their particular areas uh, and Gareth saying about Jason McCarthy on, on his crosses uh, and tap on his headers. Um, of course, one of the things that happened um, in the Bolton match was that uh, we missed uh, a penalty. Uh, and it's Mamesi missing a penalty this time after Joe Jacobson missing against Portsmouth the previous week. Um, I do wonder, and I do think, I personally, I am a fan of just absolutely belting the penalty in the back of the net uh, rather than trying to place it, as I think JJ and Anis have both done in their penalties. I, I do wonder whether we could get David Stockdale to actually do uh, the I, I, either take our penalties. Obviously, that's not really going to work. But could we get him to do the penalty-taking practice? Because easily the best penalty, possibly the best penalty I've ever seen taken, certainly the best penalty I've seen taken this season, was David Stockdale down at Exeter in the League Cup when it went to a penalty shootout. His penalty basically rips the net off um, down there at St. James Park. Could we get David Stockdale to, to do the, the penalty-taking practice? Because I think he'd be wonderful at it. It's a very good suggestion. Uh, or I'm sure um, somebody might hear that and think, oh, perhaps, perhaps we'll do that. <laughs> I hope so, yes. How, how influential yes, uh, this programme is. Uh, I, I'm sure Gareth isn't really taking tips from us, but but there you go. That That's my, you know, that, 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 that's my, my two cents worth. Uh, as it were, in, in America. <laughs> Some currency in there as well, just to prove uh, that should it, should, it, should it be necessary that you're not actually here. Um, <laughs> also, Gareth mentioned, and, and you touched on it a little, little earlier on as well, just before the game, it was announced that uh, Iraqi striker Ali Al-Hamadi uh, is, is signed for the club. Only 19 as well. Yes, uh, so he has been uh, at Swansea. Um, uh, he started off, um, apparently, so, so um, he was brought up, uh, born in Iraq, 
um, brought up then uh, in Liverpool um, and caught basically the attention of all of the clubs, Everton, Liverpool and Tranmere Rovers before he eventually joined Swansea City. Um, he's already as well been called up to the Iraqi national slide. Um, so he's so- sounding quite good. Um, I-, I particularly as well like <laughs> the fact that on his Wikipedia page, um, it even gives you the grades for his GCSEs. So, so, so there you go. You, you get a bit of everything with, with Ali. Qualifications and everything. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, four A stars, four A's and a B. So, you know, uh, pretty, pretty impressive. He, he's already looking like he's got a, a decent post-football career there as well. No, absolutely. So let's move on to uh, the game on Tuesday night down at Home Park. Long way, isn't it, Home Park? Have you been to Home Park? It is rather, yes. Yeah, it's, it's one of those where it seems to take forever to get there. And, you know, you're going all the way down the M5 and then you just sort of think, oh, we must be nearly there yet. And then you realise that actually yeah, you've still got another hour or so to go uh, as you you cross Devon. Um, I'm sure most fans probably were going along thinking, oh, well, I'm not really sure what to expect. And we probably would have taken a point beforehand um, to come back with a 3-0 win um, and to see the Wickham fans as well, because obviously all of the goals were in the second half. To see all of the Wickham fans celebrating um, wildly as those goals went in, uh, you know, congratulations and well done to you if you were one of the Wickham fans who went all the way down to Plymouth on a Tuesday night, um, because that 3-0 victory, uh, you, you very much deserved being there. And it was lovely to see you celebrating behind the goal. 316, I think it was. That's pretty impressive as well, really, isn't it, for a, for a Tuesday night? Uh, so Sam Boat scoring again uh, after 62 minutes uh, before Anis Mermetti then getting getting two late on. Uh, I particularly liked the third Wickham goal. I thought Anis took that very, very well. Um, you know, he really is becoming a, a bit of a star. And interesting to hear what Gareth said after the Bolton game that actually, you know, that, that he's really developing and sort of like some of the little tricks and some of the little, little things that Anis is now actually adding to his game. Well, yeah, really interesting seen that Gareth was saying that after the Bolton game because it very much you know we we saw evidence of that then down at home park on Tuesday night yeah lots to enjoy especially being uh, uh, level on points with now new leaders Rotherham Uh, Gareth spoke to uh, Phil once again after the game uh, at Plymouth and uh, it does get a bit windy towards the end uh, Gareth, from the way trip to the top of the table, three 0 result. You must be absolutely delighted. Absolutely delighted. I can't say, I can't speak highly enough for those boys in there. You know what we've done. We planned, we planned uh, coming down. We, you know, it's really tough for this this time with all these fixtures coming up. We were on the bus watching the Plymouth games, um, finding out what we wanted to do against them. I put a plan in place and. All I can do is ask the boys to do it. They absolutely nailed it. They were fantastic. The work rate, the fitness, the the, the tenacity. The honestly, just the never, never stop pressing and, and defending like they did. And then some fantastic goals. I told them they would have their moments. I, t- I said to them, "You'll get your moments, and when you do, you got to make them count." They made them count. I mean, Sam Bolt's been doing it for years. Anis Mamete's just started doing it, and. Uh, both, both have, uh, have taken their chances at the correct times, but then you know you look at the likes of Hanlon and I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to single anyone out. Please, 18, don't, don't be worried. He's absolutely fantastic today, every one of them. You know, boys were up at the bench again, Jack Grimm and Dara Horgan, you know, and and, and just just Sully Kakai who played Saturday, all cheering the boys on at the end. For a manager, that's all you need. We've got this group, and they will run through a brick wall for wicked one. It's not for me, for each other, and that's brilliant. You've got injuries in central midfield. It was a makeshift, I suppose, this season. Central midfield with David Wheeler, looks like Curtis Thompson. Then you lost Curtis as well, and Ollie Prenderbury, a youngster, has come on too. At one nil in a, in a pretty, uh, you know, a game could have gone either way at that stage. That's a big ask for the youngster. Got to trust him, you know. Got to trust him. That's why we signed these players. You know, look at Mamete a year ago, trusting him, and he's come up with the goods today. But you know, me and me and. Uh, Bale, I can find out a chat about Ollie actually this afternoon um, and, and he needs to know that he's trusted and, and he wants a chance to deliver um, and speaking of Bale, he's doing that now he's this this whole guy don't write him off by the way but he is now taking on that that mantle of the, the pastoral care the behind the scenes he's doing amazing I mean everything just falling in place at the moment it's really early Phil I'm not getting carried away but it's hard not to when you come to top of the league and, and, and put a performance in like that, you know. Plymouth are a very good side, very good manager, and we've got some fantastic fans, you know. Uh, I know there's a pantomime issue here and, and I'm the villain, but this passionate and, and this is a tough place to come. No wonder they've been so high in the league. They play some good football and got great support. But tonight, I thought we thoroughly deserved the, the win and, uh, like I say, a few changes might have ranged some eyebrows at the end there, but they were all 
a plan to uh, to negate what Plymouth were trying to do to us. They'll be back. It's very early in the season. I'm not getting carried away, but inside I'm jumping around because I've seen probably the performance of the season. Oh, maybe not because we've done so well at home, but performance at the right time. Everyone thought we'd gone off the rails. Believe me, the rumours of us uh, of us being an average team are, are untrue. We, uh, we're a good side and we want to keep being a good side and we want to keep pushing and probing and, and attacking these teams away from home and being super entertaining at home as well. Plymouth were unbeaten before today here at home in the league and you've not only beaten them, you've kept a clean sheet as well. Yeah, Stockholm's over the moon, you know, that's all he cares about. Is, uh, he cares about winning but he loves his clean sheets and... Uh, and you know it's uh, it's a great place to come and do that. You know after the Ipswich and Portsmouth results, Portsmouth performance was out of this world. How we haven't won that, I'll never know. But the uh, the wheels are firmly back on. Um, I'd like to let everyone know that. And uh, looking forward to the next game. Next game, Sheffield Wednesday, another long away day. But this will give you the perfect platform for that trip. Yeah, we're going to have to rest the legs and get the legs back because. There's some boys there, Curtis Thompson's limped off, Sam Volks has limped off, but I've got Sully Kaka, I've got Daryl Horgan, you know, I've got, I've got um, Jack Grimm on the bench there. Three real big names in League One. Um, so it will be a squad game, it always is. Um, and tonight belongs to the squad. Some really positive things to come from that, uh, not to mention uh, at least the uh, the depth of the squad, uh, some, of the, some of the names on the bench there, as Gareth mentioned. Yeah, yeah, but... Very, very impressive. Um, uh, you know, he, he, he slightly just singled out Brandon Handler and then obviously slightly regressed it. Uh, it does sound like a, you know, a, the the complete team performance. Um, and really interesting as well then what he was saying about Bayo and and how obviously he's doing so much behind the scenes, um, just you know, pre- preparing the team and and helping out. Um, which I, I think for somebody of his stature um, and, and and just you know all of the stuff that we know that Bayo has going on on social media and all that sort of stuff, you don't really expect that actually he's he's behind the scenes doing all of that and it's just absolutely brilliant to, to hear that even those players who aren't playing are you know contributing in such a massive massive way uh, to the club Still to come on the Wickham Wanderers show, we'll be catching up with the chairman of the Wickham Wanderers Ex-Players Association, Alan Hutchinson, uh, talking about his time working with different managers at the club. And we'll look ahead to Saturday's trip to Sheffield Wednesday here at Wickham Sound. Online, on Radio Player and on 106.6 FM, this is Wickham Sound. Second part of the Wickham Wanderers show, and for this week, uh, a bit of a special, I'm very pleased to say, uh, we can chat to the chairman of the Wickham Wanderers Ex-Players Association, Alan Hutchinson, who uh, was also a press officer at Wickham Wanderers uh, for a very long time, worked with uh, many, many managers. Uh, Alan, thank you so much for uh, speaking to us, and it must have been uh, brilliant to be uh, so close to uh, so many managers and so many different characters over the years as well. Oh, very much so. It was a terrific experience, because they were all different, and everything they did was different, except they wanted to win. And uh, it was just marvellous to be with such great people who played the game and who previously managed in the game and suddenly coming to Wickham Wanderers, which I must say, the move to Adams Park gave the whole uh, club a total uplift with the stadium being with the wonderful pitch and all the the brand new stadiums uh, stands they put in and the back behind the scenes it was good the dressing rooms everything was in good shape and so when somebody came for a job and got taken round they thought yeah this is uh, something I, somewhere I'd like to be and as I'm sure you've heard the different um, ex-players and former managers that we've spoken to on the show before they've all said how special uh, the club is and that must be something that you've seen you know up close well very much so because I went to Lokes Park for the very first time in 1952 when my grandfather took me along to a game just before my 10th birthday, um, when I saw London, uh, no, Tufnell Park, Edmonton. And it was their very last game at Lokes Park because they were bottom of the league. And uh, they were, they went out finally at the end and never came back. It was never reformed again because financially they, they just couldn't afford to, to come into the, the, the Ishmael, Ishmael League. But... Um, I'll never forget walking across the Rye, and we lived in London Road at the time, on the main road there. We were walking across the Rye, and, oh, he was really chatting up to us. It's going to be a great game today, lad. He said, you'll see plenty of goals. Well, it ended nil-nil, and it was the most incredible game of football I've ever seen because people were suddenly getting hurt and lying on the ground. And At one point, I thought somebody had been killed the way he just laid there and never got up. But uh, it was just an amazing experience. 
And then after the game, I got introduced to the very first coach the club had hired, uh, hired Jim McCormack, because uh, my grandfather had known him. Um, and, uh, you know, it was just a wonderful time. So immediately after that, I just started going to all the home games. So I guess a name who's most synonymous with their football club and who everyone mentions when, whenever you hear the name Wickham Wanderers and, uh, and someone who we were fortunate enough to speak to on the previous series of the, of the show, Martin O'Neill, and that, he must have been someone who's, who's fantastic to work with. Oh, absolutely amazing. An incredible man. Um, everything had to be done his way because that was the way he was. Most of the time he got it right. Occasionally he might not, but it didn't take very long to change that and get it right. He, he was an amazing character. And... Um, at first, I wondered whether I was going to be capable of working with him because here we had a guy who played for Nottingham Forest and Brian Clough, who was the most amazing manager. And, um, and also, of course, Republic, the, 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 Northern, the captain of Northern Ireland. Fantastic team, which they had when Martin played. Um, so he was somebody very, very special. And uh, that came across when he spoke to the players or when he spoke to anybody else at the club. But once you started working with him, got to really know him, you realised what it was an honour to work with a guy like that. And we've heard all sorts of um, behind-the-scenes stories from the, the likes of Terry Evans and, and the, you know, people that, that, that have experienced you know, what Martin was like in the, the dressing room, obviously. But did it feel a bit like a, a sort of a revolutionary period because, obviously, it was the time that you know, the club were getting promoted to the Football League and, as you mentioned, moving to Adams Park as well? Well, yes, absolutely. But, I mean... It, not only that, of course, I mean, he took us to Wembley twice and we won the FA Trophy, which was a phenomenal achievement. But then, uh, you know, I remember him saying to me, he said, oh, don't worry, Hutch, he said, we won't be in this division for too much longer. He said, we're going to go into the Football League. I said, what? He said, yes, yeah. he said, well, don't worry about it. He said, we'll do it. And sure enough, we did. We won, won the GM Vauxhall Conference and got promoted. And um, I think that really gave him one hell of a lift because... He had chances to move to clubs like Leicester City, Norwich. There were quite a few clubs that wanted him, but he decided to turn all of them down to stay at Wickham because he wanted to get them into the Football League and do the very best he could for moving the club upwards before a finally good offer came in from Norwich, I think it was, and off he went. And he obviously built such a, 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 a team which, you know, the backbone of the team stayed the same for, for a number of years as well and obviously played some very exciting football as well. Oh, very much so. And I'll never forget, uh, he came in and after, oh, I don't know, six months or so, he said, um, how long have some of these players been here? I said, well, quite a while. I said, because at the old ground, we had quite a few of them. I said, they were brought in by the previous manager. He said, why they? He said, it was that. So I said, well, it's Jim Kelman. Goodness me, he said, he had a terrific eye for players. He really did. And, of course, what he was talking about was inheriting, as it were, players like Steve Guppy, Matt Crossley, um, you, you know, just to name, there's only two at the moment, but there were, there were so many that really good players that Jim had got into the team and had moved on. And when Martin took over, I'm sure he was thinking, well, we'll make a few changes. But he made very few because the quality of the players he had, he stuck with. And obviously during your time at the club, there are so many other um, managers that, that you were sort of working with, especially after, after Martin left as well, but some, some really uh, names that, that went on to, to much better things as well. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, and thoroughly, thoroughly deserved to as well because of what they did with, with us. Um, uh, John Gregory, he did pretty well. You know, he moved on. He, he got uh, picked up by Aston Villa and had a good time at Aston Villa. Um, Laurie Sanchez had, had, had come in and he'd done exceptionally well and he'd worked at other clubs. Tony Adams, of course, that was oh unbelievable because uh, and I did say to the owner I thought it was a big mistake taking him on. I did tell him that. And the reason for that was that here you've got a guy who'd played his entire life at the very highest, highest level for Arsenal and then suddenly he was a captain of England. And he didn't know what it was like to play below that. Clueless. And uh, I know when he came, he's a really nice guy. I like Tony. He was a smashing fellow. I got on with him very well. Um, and, um, you know, after a while he said, oh, I didn't realise the standard must be as low as this. I said, well, 
I said, I did tell him that. I said, and I've got to be honest with you, Tony, I also suggested to him it might have been better not to bring you in. And he just cracked up. You know, he thought it was funny because he could see what I was saying, that him playing at that level of football. But nonetheless, he really stuck with it. Just, he got into it and he did some really good things for some of the players and the, at the club. And although he decided to go um, himself, he never got the sack, but he decided to leave um, because he had a few personal things going on and he thought it was better that he would go when he did. But um, I liked him and uh, a lot of the players liked him as well. Um, and, uh, you know, for someone who'd never even experienced that level of football, in the end, he did reasonably well. And we spoke to John Gorman on the show recently as well because he returned to Adams Park uh, recently to, uh, as a guest of the club and obviously he's someone who, who has a fantastic track record but, and all the players love playing for him as well. Oh yeah, well, the great thing is with John was that he loved to play football, really real football. Um, you know, he'd, get training, he'd have training sessions where he'd uh, tell them all to move the ball quickly for people to make a lot of movement to receive the ball. The only... And... and it was just terrific to watch when his teams played. It was wonderful to watch. There was the only one problem I had with it, and I did tell him this at the time, was that um, with so many players moving forward and really whipping the ball all over the place, if we lost it or gave it away, then we were struggling at the back because all of a sudden the pressure was on. And some of the games were just amazing. I mean, there were several several 3-3 three, three draws, I said. So 4-3, a 5-1. And these were all the scores that we used to get, uh, playing the way he did, but it was highly entertaining. And he was very, very popular as well. And it was very sad when John went because he'd lost his wife, Myra, very sadly in the February of that year that he left. And um, he had two months off to try and recover, but he was hit, struck very badly by it. And uh, in the April, he said, no, I'm sorry, I've got to depart. I don't really want to do this anymore. So that's how we lost him. But no, he was he did very well. And you mentioned Laurie Sanchez as well. Obviously, a, a fantastic, uh, very famous uh, cup run and, a, and an appearance at, at Villa Park as well. That must have been a really great time to be working closely with the manager. Oh, Sanchez was a great guy to work with. I've thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed working with him. And um, uh, Terry Gibson. Terry Gibson was a terrific fella. Absolutely top-notch. The players loved him. He wasn't a coach, but... He had clever ideas of how he used to get through to the players. He'd be on the training ground. He would play in the game. And then suddenly he would stop it and say, no, look, you should be running here because the ball's about to go there, so you should be running there. You should, on this right-hand side, you should be moving up so that when the person over there gets it, he passes it to you. And it all used to work really well. And the players loved him. They absolutely loved him. Um, and Sanch did the most incredible job getting us to the semi-final of the FA Cup. And Liverpool had to make two strong substitutions to make sure they beat us because we were giving them one hell of a game. And in the end, they won 2-1. But, um, you know, it was, a, it was a tremendous achievement by Laurie. Then he made a very big mistake. And it was sad that that happened because he'd done so well because he'd felt now that he'd put so much into it. He wanted to have an extra coach come in. Um, and I said, well, what about Gibbo? I mean, he's, he's done well. Yeah, he, I know he has such, but he's not a coach. I said, but he, players love him. They love him. Well, it turned the, t- turned the tables for Laurie because he brought this guy in and um, he wasn't very popular. Uh, and unfortunately, we started losing games. And we went to um, ba- 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 the, to- the club, the other oh, Tranmere Rovers, the club the other side of the of Liverpool, yeah, Tranmere Rovers, that was his very last game, and he said, well, whatever happens today, I'm, I'm going, they've told me they want me to go, so uh, a few of us that knew him well and worked with him well and really got on with him, we all sat together and toasted his departure, um, we were nil-nil with about ten minutes to go, and then one of the Wickham lads put the ball through his own net, and we lost one-nil, and that was the departure of Laurie Sanchez. It must be great to have such a close working relationship though with so many different people, and I know you know some of the managers have become you know personal friends as well. Oh, without a doubt, yeah. I mean, I don't. Martin, I still keep in touch with quite a bit. I don't hear from him as much as I used to, and I don't ring him as much as I used to. But um, you know, it's just great to keep in touch with him because they're such terrific people. Um, Sanch, I'd not heard of from for a long, long time, but he's a great guy. Um, John Gorman, I saw 
a few weeks ago when he came to the club, and it was nice to chat to him again. Uh, but, yeah, it's just really nice. Of course, John Reardon, somebody I knew very, very well, because uh, John ran the club, club after Brian Lee um, departed from the manager's position. And I met John in the 50s when he played for the club, and he was a good manager. He did very well when he took over from Brian. And the good thing about him was, a lot of people probably wouldn't have known, but um, he had a very good eye for a player. And I went to several teams with him to look at players. And after a short while, he'd say, yep, yeah, that's the guy, I like him. He's the one, he's the one. And he'd say, oh, and I told him to look at this guy. He said, not sure about him, not sure about him. And nine times out of ten, those remarks were so accurate, they turned out to be exactly what he said after a few more games. Um, so we signed quite a number of players that John has suggested we should take on. And he did, he did a lot very well for the club, John Reardon, very well. And are there any other uh, managers that you work with who you know, particularly stand out or perhaps any memorable occasions especially that stand out? Um, well, I think I'll manage most of them. Paul Lambert, of course, was another one you've not mentioned, but he came in uh, and he did very well. Um, and, uh, again, somebody that had a good eye for a player, uh, and he did very well. Um, Neil Smiley, unfortunately, he he was working with John Gregory, and when John Gregory went, Neil took over. And um, his first few games, he did very well, but then when they made him the manager, things started to slide a bit. And so, unfortunately, he didn't uh, last that, that long. But um, it was someone else that, that ran the club. Alan Smith was another one. Um, yeah, again, he started well, but uh, didn't carry on, and he wasn't there for very long. But in the in the main, um, Jim Kelman was someone I liked very much because I first met him at a coaching course at Bissom Abbey, um, where Brian was, of course, was the director. Brian Lee was the, the director. Uh, and that was good because he was also the manager of Wickham. So I got to know him very well. And uh, when when um, uh, Jim took over, uh, it was because we had been working for two years together at Bissom Abbey coaching during the summer. Young kids coming in and on the summer break and wanted to do some coaching. And we used to train them and, and get them going. And then after a while, Brian, who got to know him very well and used to watch what we were up to, uh, took him away to one side and said, look, we're looking for a new manager at the football club. And I've told them that uh, maybe you're the man. And that was exactly how it happened. And Jim Kelman, of course, of course, took the job in 1978. No, it's fantastic. You must be so proud as well of how the, the Ex Players Association has, has developed in the, in the years since you, since you founded it, and, and former managers as well who, who are members too. Oh, very, very much indeed. Very much indeed. And this was something that I'd thought about for a very long time. They asked me in the 70s to do a, um, a selection of articles on the old players for the match day programme because the programme sales were dropping. And they said, look, if you could write some articles for me, for us, because uh, it might give it a bit of a lift. Well, because I knew quite a few of the old boys who played in the 1920s and 30s and 40s, I did interviews with all of them. And, of course, they were so interested and fascinating reading these things because they were people they'd heard about but didn't know anything about. And suddenly here it was in the match day program. And the sales went, shoom, they really rose. And uh, it was while I, would do, I was doing the interviews with the 20s boys, it really, it really came upon me, well, an ex-players association would be fantastic because they say to me, oh, I understand you're doing an interview with so-and-so. Yes, I am. Oh, well, give him my best wishes when you see him, will you? He said, oh, I haven't seen him for about 15 years. And you see, by having an ex-players association, you can knock that on the head. You have meetings, you have annual dinners, and such as us this year, for example, we've got um, some really good things going on. Obviously, we've suffered like everybody else uh, with the lockdown in, in, in these last couple of years, or so, which has been pretty bad. But our annual dinner, which we had to cancel for November, as we always hold it in November, we've now cancelled that, and we're going to hold it now on Friday the 6th of May at the football club. We've also booked our quiz night for Friday the 19th of March, 
which is a terrific evening, always run by John Maskell and uh, Vince Faulkner, and they do a terrific job, <clears throat> and it really is a good event. Then we got the bowls on Tuesday the 21st of June at um, the Iowick and Bowls Club in Chestnut Avenue, which is a John Taylor thing. It was something that he launched and wanted to do. And then our, we got our golf day, which um, was originally launched by myself and um, oh, Jack Tomlin uh, quite a few years ago now, but that's been very successful too. Uh, and that's going to be on Friday the 22nd of July. And then we're going to hold another annual dinner for this year, or sorry, I beg your pardon, for next year, on hopefully uh, Friday the 25th of November. That's to be confirmed that date, mainly because we've not had the fixture list out for next season. And being on a Friday, we don't know whether Wickham will be at home. And if they are, that wouldn't be a good night to hold it. So um, anyway, that's the kind of thing that happens. We have all these, event these events going on. And then we've got a fantastic committee uh, which do all this work. We all get together and uh, go through things, and, and it's just wonderful the way it's done. I mean, John Maskell's our president. Um, JDT, or John D. Taylor, is the vice chairman. Uh, Vince Faulkner's just been point, appointed the treasurer. Um, Glyn Creaser, bless him, is uh, the new membership secretary, and he's luckily recovering from what was a very nice, nasty incident, but uh, he's, he's on the on the way up. So we hope to see him soon. And Susie Clark is our secretary. And Susie's a lovely girl. I mean, I took her on in 1996, and she worked at the club and it was terrific. And she worked for many years there. And then when I launched this, I asked her if she'd be the secretary. And she said, oh, I'd love to. So she's the secretary. And Jog Bignall is our uh, a ticket master. So if any of the players want a ticket, they give John a ring, and he books it all, gets it all organised. And then Ken Wilson, of course, who helps run the golf. Uh, Bob Dell, I haven't seen him for a while, but he's very, very busy. Keith Samuels, a great player in the 60s and early 70s, and uh, he's a real character. Brian Lee is uh, good to have on it for, you know, his past history with the club and what his knowledge in football. And Peter Sudderby, who's both an ex-player and a former manager of the club. So it's a terrific committee. and uh, We meet up once a month and make these decisions. Some fantastic names, and also the camaraderie as well with the different generations of former players comes across so well. Oh, yeah, well, it has to be, because, you see, when I wanted to launch this, I had a list of players like uh, Jack Tomlin was from the 50s, and he was going to be on it. By having a player from the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, as we did when we launched, it meant they knew everybody they played with, usually got their numbers or emails, and they could be contacted. And although I knew many of them, I mean, it's difficult to try and make a list of everybody, you know, that you probably haven't got. But whereas getting the player in that knows them, it was easily done. It was easily manageable. And of course, it's now taken us to over 100 members, which is fantastic. Uh, despite every year we lose three, anywhere between three and six people. So if people want to find out more about the Ex-Players Association, how do, they, how do they go about that? Well, if they want to know more about the Ex-Players Association... They can either uh, contact me, Alan Hutchinson, and my email is uh, alanhutch43 at gmail.com. Or they can either contact John Taylor, and blimey, would you believe it, I've not got his details in front of me, unfortunately. Oh, no trouble. But um, y you've got it, because Colin's got that. Colin Besley have that. Uh, but John Taylor's the man to contact as well, myself. And uh, if they want to join, then we'd really love to have them. And if there's anything else they need to know, coming to any of our events, which they're welcome to come to. You know, they can come to the events if they'd like to. All they've got to do is ask. And, um, you know, they'll be there. Because it's great to see these players. Because some of them... We have a situation now where some of them had never, ever met before because they played in different eras. But they've now become really friendly and they play golf together or they play in a group or they just meet up, you know, and it's just terrific the way it's all happened. 
No, it's been fantastic to, to share your memories and, and to get your thoughts and to hear more about the Ex Player Association. Thank you so much for your time. Pleasure. Uh, Alan Hutchinson, who's the uh, the chairman of uh, Wickham Wanderers Ex Player Association, a former press officer at the club as well, speaking to us here at Wickham Sound. Online, on Radio Player, and on 106.6 FM. This is Wickham Sound. So, uh, the final part of the Wickham Wanderer Show continues. Uh, we're uh, keeping you up to date with uh, uh, all things going on at the club, including Wickham Wanderers women, of course, who you might have heard chatting with uh, Rob on Saturday at Adams Park with Dave Ward, their manager, who I learned uh, comes from Rygate in Surrey. He travels up from there. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, it was, it was the same on, on uh, Sunday. So, yes, uh, going down 4 0 to Abingdon Town uh, after obviously the, the wonderful 3 0 victory over Oxford City the previous week. Um, but as we've been saying uh, about the men, you know, they're, they're, they will definitely bounce back. They are playing uh, Woodley United at home uh, on uh, Sunday at the Flackwell Heath campus of the Amersham and Wickham College, uh, a 2 pm kickoff on Sunday. Currently third from bottom, but as we've highlighted, still fairly early in the season. They've played some tough teams, struggling with injury as well, uh, with uh, Captain Charlotte Bagshaw missing and Bobby, who we heard from on Saturday as well, uh, also out with uh, awaiting a, a knee uh, operation in March, I believe. So, uh, yeah, uh, as you say, uh, won't be long, hopefully, till a corner is turned there. Definitely, yes, you know, onwards and upwards, uh, up, up the wick women, as uh, Pete Kuhig might say. <laughs> he might say that, yeah. If not, he certainly should start doing that. Uh, no, you I think he should, yes. You mentioned a little earlier on some of the, the, the social media uh, chat, which has been uh, floating about, oh, uh, about yes, the yeah. team, the style of play. Um, you mentioned, you know, Gareth Cohen for some criticism as well. He described himself as a panto villain. I, I assume that was, <laughs> a, a, that was a separate separate issue entirely. I, I think so. Yes, I, I, I assume that, that that was referring to obviously the fact that you know we we didn't like Derek Adams and they probably don't like Dan, Gareth Ainsworth. That was the one thing about the win over Plymouth. You know what, what a shame that it wasn't Derek Adams still in charge. But you know he's obviously now moved on to pastures new, both then going to Morecambe and then walking out on them quite quickly after getting them promoted and now at Bradford City. And many of the, the Plymouth players appear to be, uh, according to reports, going down quite easily. And uh, also Wickham got some criticism as well for, for time wasting. But to win three 0 at the league leaders, that, that's got to be a pretty pretty decent result. Oh, completely, absolutely. And uh, all of those things with regards to the time wasting. You know, I, I know that we come in for the criticism, but you don't watch every club doing it. And and when we're losing one nil, you see all of our opponents in League One doing all of the same things that we do. So actually why we've got this reputation uh, for time wasting, uh, yeah, I, I sort of get it because, yes, definitely, you know that David Stockdale is going to do those little cheeky things such as uh, basically walk, decide that actually he wants to take the goal kick from the other side of the goal. But as I say, all teams do it. So, uh, you know, I, I slightly get it and I slightly don't as to why we're always singled out. Um, it's just one of those tags that now, you know, do, that we have to wear. And yeah, I, I agree with you as well. I think having watched the, the bits of the Plymouth game, they, they did go down rather easily um, and could easily get get a, a tag of, well, you know, they're, they're always looking for free kicks in a way that we, I don't think, ever do. Um, and goodness me, particularly, you know, when we have Bayo playing up front, every time Bayo plays up front, you know, you can <laughs> you can basically commit grievous bodily harm against Bayo and not get a free kick every time. Uh, so Sheffield Wednesday on Saturday, Today, a team who are only five points behind us in the table. Yeah, it's, it's our old friend Sheffield Wednesday. We, we obviously, you know, we always quite like going up there, don't we? And they're, they're always quite welcoming because, of course, we went to their promotion party however many years ago it was now. They're doing okay, aren't they? So they, they won their last uh, two games. So they beat MK Dons. Uh, thank you for that. 2-1 on Tuesday night. Before that, they won 3-2 away at Accrington Stanley um, before they were beaten 3-0 uh, by Plymouth in uh, the FA Cup. But yeah, they're, they're looking, looking rather good at the moment uh, in a way that I wasn't necessarily necessarily expecting currently seventh in at the table so possibly next time we speak we can wonder if it could be league one leaders that could be quite exciting wouldn't it I mean, wouldn't that be wonderful? Uh, and, and again, you know, rather unexpected. Sorry, I, I got that wrong. They are fifth. I, I was looking at an old statistic um, on, on a particular website. Uh, yes, they're currently fifth in the division. And yes, you know, we could go top. Although we've said that quite often this season and it's never actually happened. So let, let's, you know, let, let, let's not count our chickens yet. No, definitely not. But really in a good position, obviously, going into what could be uh, quite a key uh, Christmas period as well. 
Yeah, and one of the nice things, in a way, uh, looking back now on, on the FA Cup defeats to Hartlepool, is that actually the team have got a bit of a break coming up, which they haven't really had. Um, obviously, we had the international break uh, against Ipswich when we didn't play, but then since then, we, we obviously have opted to play uh, in the two fixtures since then. Uh, so, yes, so after Sheffield Wednesday, the next game is then on the 7th of December when Burton Albion once again visit Adams Park. So let's hope uh, that it will be a very different different uh, game to the Checker Trades, Leyland Daff Pizza Cup thing, because uh, obviously that was a little bit painful. But at the same time, I think it probably was uh, a one-off. Uh, and as Gareth alluded to in one of the interviews, you know, that was with the development squad, even though obviously it does, does count uh, as a result. Um, and then we've got another home game after that as well, uh, when AFC Wimbledon visit us on the 11th of December. And another game against Bolton coming up soon as well. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so we go back to Bolton uh, on uh, the 18th. You know, the, one of those quirks of the fixture list, uh, to be to be honest, I prefer the, the way that the Germans do it, where actually, you, you know, you, you play everyone in a particular order and then you play them again in a particular order, while, rather than this slightly odd, you know, there'll always be a couple of games where actually, yeah, you might play them one month and then you play them another month. Because you do think, well, I don't know, if you've got a player who's out sort of like injured for, for several games, it seems slightly unfair that then possibly they miss um, two games against a potential opponent. But it is what it is. And yes, uh, Bolton uh, at, uh, away on the 18th of December uh, before then, a home game uh, to Cambridge United on Boxing day um and goodness me christmas is coming around rather quickly now isn't it uh, the fact that it's the 25th of november today uh, so if you haven't started buying your presents yet uh, then uh, as you might have guessed already uh, dog leads are available in the club shop <laughs> and where will you be speaking to us from next week <laughs> um so next week i will be speaking to you hopefully uh, from uh, high wickham strangely enough oh you're back next week of course I am back next week, yes, yes. Uh, so I'll be sitting opposite you in my cowboy hat and my cowboy boots. <laughs> Look forward to seeing what you've brought back from America. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, I shall, I shall see. You know, I'll bring you a Cleveland Browns dog lead as well. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, good to speak to you. Have a good week. Thank you very much. Great to chat to uh, Bob, who's in New York for Thanksgiving. Uh, Luke's joined us as well. <laughs> With the, the New York uh, themed soundtrack. Uh, we were talking um, to Bob a short time ago about the fact that um, Rob Shaw obviously comes from Adams Park on a, a home match day on a Saturday as well now, and, and we had the, the Wickham Wanderers ladies uh, on as well, which was fantastic, and Dave Ward, uh, the, uh, the manager, who I've learnt comes from Rygate in Surrey <laughs> especially. Um, Educational programme. Yes, and really good to hear from uh, Bobby uh, Lynch as well on, on Saturday, who um, is awaiting a, a knee operation, yes. but, but great to hear from all the, the Wickham Wanderers women as well, and, and, and we heard from Bob as well from the Trust, uh, who will be a guest on this show as well, I think, coming up very soon. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's... Um it's very interesting how over the the season how because um gareth and obviously the team and rob and pete want to make it an event to go to it's it's really interesting to see how many more people are coming in obviously as as um rob said a couple of weeks ago the fact the team are doing well also of course helps as well um but also the the other people that are in the club that you don't see a lot of normally on a game so the sports and education trust the wickham wanderers trust the ladies uh, are all part of it and it just it's great to have the whole wickham wanderers family um, at these at these home games, it does really generate such a, a sort of a feeling of an event, which, as you mentioned, is what is what the Cougars are trying to do with the, the fireworks. People are talking about yeah. that, the Chairboys Village, the live music, the the um, the grill, the grill, oh, the Hellfire bomb, uh, the Hellfire bonfire, no, the Hellfire barbecue uh, by Mr. Will the Chef uh, is excellent. I highly recommend it. And trying to watch Phil get one is also <laughs> very entertaining. Which is and nice. it's nice to have that interaction with the fans, and, and they can come along and, and chat to to, to Rob about. <laughs> Football. They can and, show off their football knowledge <laughs> against Robs, yeah, and you know, give their predictions and, and talk about how they think the game is going, and it really adds to the to the match atmosphere. Yeah, it's been really nice. We've had um, we've had some sort of some of the same voices over the last couple of weeks as well as people are getting more to to trust us uh, that we're not going <laughs> to ask silly questions. Uh, so yeah, it's been really great to talk to the fans and and obviously being inside the stadium as well has been great because we've been part of moments like ma- uh, Player of the Month and obviously new player as well being announced on Saturday and lots of flames. Interesting for Rob and the team as well as the temperatures drop. Yes, we've now got a heating inside the gazebo as well but to keep us a little bit warmer in the, the cooler months. No, definitely. So uh, plenty of uh, home games to look forward to as they away on Saturday to Sheffield Wednesday and it could end the, uh, the weekend top of the table. Uh, level on points at the moment with uh, uh, Sheffield Wednesday. Uh, no, that's not true. Sheffield Wednesday is who they're playing. Uh, they're <laughs> fifth in the table. Rob, thank you. Uh, Rotherham uh, both with Wickham on 37 points. Uh, both Rotherham and Wickham have had uh, back-to-back victories. Uh, Sheffield Wednesday a bit more uh, actually, Sheffield Wednesday have had back-to-back victories as well, but they're a bit more kind of up and down in their in their form. So hopefully, uh, it should be a good game. We we'll get a good result, and then we've got more home games to come.
as well, the likes of uh, Bert and Albion uh, coming very soon as well. Lots to look forward to, uh, lots of great guests coming up on the Wickham Wanderer show in the coming weeks as well. Uh, it feels like a really good time to be back in the blues. Uh, Bob will be back from America as well next week, looking forward to... <laughs> He might have got an accent or something. Or, or he certainly brings some merchandise and perhaps some club shop ideas uh, for Wickham as well. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Uh, don't forget there's the podcast available version available of the show as well uh, of that, uh, from tomorrow. And you can catch up with that and more here at Wickham Sound. Up the wick. <laughs> <laughs>